You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Like a star in the darkness of night, Benedict of Nursia brilliantly shines a glory not only to Italy, but of the whole church. Pope Pius XII. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on St. Benedict. His very name means blessing. And without doubt, he seems to have been born blessed, like many saints and sinners, with a sharp intellect and an unflinching drive for sacrifice and hard work, and with an inborn instinct for high ideals. But many are born with these same traits, aren't they, and aren't numbered among the saints. Fact is, we aren't judged by the number of our blessings, but by how much we bless. And boy, did St. Benedict bless. Born around 480 A.D. into a noble Italian family, young Benedict's parents followed the basic protocol of well-to-do families in their set, sending their teenage son to Rome for a high-profile education. This transition away from his home would have been expected by Benedict, but leaving behind his sister Scholastica, his twin by birth and by dint of nature, must have been jarring and he may have had no idea of the world he was actually being moved into. He'd likely have been a sheltered child, raised in the faith, with a sensitive, virtuous turn of mind. There is no telling what scenes he might have been subjected to in Rome. But we know that the corruption of the ancient and long-debauched city proved a shock to him. So much a shock that Benedict ended up running away. Dismayed that his family would expect him to stay amid such sin and degradation, he lost himself to them and to the world for three years, finding a cave in the desert mountains of Subiaco, where he perfected himself with prayer and fasting, almost to the point of starvation. But as we always see in the stories of the saints, God stepped in. He had plans for a great monastic order that couldn't be accomplished by young Benedict if he starved to death. So when the timing was right, the Heavenly Father dispatched a holy monk named Romanus to the rescue. And with the same divine inspiration that allowed the old monk to find Benedict's precariously situated hermitage, Romanus proceeded to fill in the spiritual stones missing from Benedict's path to sanctity. Imagine the scene. Because it was almost impossible to reach the cave settled halfway down a cliff, the old monk would tie a loaf of bread to a piece of rope lower it to Benedict, and sit on the edge of the cliff, conversing with him about God and heaven. Two dirty desert wanderers hidden in the crags of a mountain, two bright beams shining from the darkness of earth to heaven like searchlights. It was not long before Romanus was the student and Benedict the mentor, but their peace and quiet did not last long. I expect when God wants it to be so, the angels fly around whispering in people's ears about holy hermits, and as it so often happens, in spite of Benedict's personal preference, word spread about this holy monk in the mountain, drawing to the cliff scores of supplicants and hopeful followers. Within a short time, divine inspiration again, or more likely divine insistence, urged Benedict to climb down from his cave and set about the task of organizing all the young men milling about prayerfully, begging for leadership. Having finished his own novitiate on the mountain, his life's work could begin. Following in the footsteps of the early desert monks of Egypt, St. Benedict organized his first community in the region of Subiaco, Italy, about 70 kilometers or 44 miles east of Rome building eventually twelve remote abbeys, including his chief monastery, the famous Monte Cassino, which is known as the cradle of the Benedictine order, and where Benedict chiefly lived until his death in 547 AD. But before all the physical building began, he constructed his most lasting edifice, the Benedictine Rule, the reason that St. Benedict is called the father of Western monasticism. Relying heavily on the spirit of prayer, mortification, and hard work, St. Benedict set out a plan of life for all those who would commit themselves to his order of religion. The three chief vows are familiar to us today, poverty, chastity, and obedience, which are fairly self-explanatory. But along with these three, he added another triptych, work, study, and prayer. Virtually every moment of a Benedictine's day is spoken for within the rule. Matins begin at midnight, 
followed by prayers and chant at a set schedule every three hours throughout the day, interspersed with the work necessary to sustain the abbey, plus spiritual reading, writing, and contemplation until 9 p.m. when the monks can take a few hours rest. It is a hard, and I imagine as is true with most vocations, both a highly frustrating and a highly rewarding way of life. A rigor you'd think they'd have expected when they signed on for it, but as the years went on and the numbers of Benedictines grew, the spirit of the world and the treachery of Satan interfered, as so often happens, developing into, believe it or not, more than one attempt on St. Benedict's life by malcontents within his own community. One of the famous miracles of St. Benedict gives a good idea of how deep the malice could be even within the walls of a monastery, and how the devil hated Benedict's labors for God. It happened on one occasion that Father Abbot Benedict had by the vote of a nearby community replaced an abbot recently deceased, whose rule was not as strict as St. Benedict's. Though the decision to join the Benedictines in their rule had been popular, it was not unanimous. And so when our saint began to crack the whip, so to speak, some were less than happy. Here's the rest of the story taken from the golden legend. When they saw that they might not do their wills under him, they gave him venom meddled with wine to drink. But St. Benedict made the sign of the cross over it and blessed it, and anon the vessel break in pieces which was of glass. When St. Benedict then knew so that in that vessel was mortal drink, which might not abide nor suffer the sign of the cross, he rose up and said, God have mercy on you, fair brethren. I said to you well at the beginning that my conditions and manners appertain not to yours. From thenceforth get ye to another father, for I may no longer dwell here. And then he went again to the desert, where God showed for him many signs and miracles, and he founded there two abbeys. So as you see, St. Benedict did not suffer evil or entertain weakness, wrestling often with actual demons and with the demonic attributes of his fellow man. But his overall manner was well known in his time as mild and patient. St. Gregory the Great, in a satisfying segue from last week's feast day quick take, was a big fan of St. Benedict's. Born only a handful of years after the death of our saint in the mid-sixth century, Pope St. Gregory regarded not only the brilliant influence of Benedict's order and the big picture of the spiritual world, but he admired the man himself, setting down in his dialogues a biography of St. Benedict, which included many instances of the personal warmth and goodness of the Father Abbot that had been re related to him directly by St. Benedict's succeeding abbots, Constantinus and Honoratus. In one story, Pope St. Gregory tells how St. Benedict decided it would be best to stay on a mountain through the night in prayer, refusing any resources to be brought to him, chiefly because he wished to save his monks the trouble of having to carry anything up to him and to remove from their lives a, quote, just cause of grumbling. How many of us parents understand this sacrifice for the better good? Though he was the founder of the fastest growing religious order on the planet at the time, St. Benedict busied himself with the interests of the lowliest of the monks. Pope Gregory tells about a time when, on visiting one of the abbeys, Father Abbot met a promising but too easily distracted young monk who could not seem to, quote, remain quietly at his prayers as the other monks did. So, good father that he was, Benedict remained three extra days in that abbey, working on the character of the one young monk until he learned, quote, not to go forth from the chapel and wander about busying himself in worldly and transitory things. Though Benedictines are a contemplative order whose aim is to be removed from the world, St. Benedict did, of course, interact with the community surrounding the monastery as well, coming to the rescue of not only the sick and hungry, but raising the dead on occasion, and one time raising an axe from the bottom of a well for a laborer who really, really needed his axe. Even as he oversaw the smooth and pious running of the massive operation that was Monte Cassino and all its sister abbeys, Benedict never lost sight of the needs of the people, glorifying God in true charity. Living at the time of the fall of Rome and the necessity of regenerating a new cultural order, St. Benedict led the way out of the darkness of chaos, one soul at a time, recreating Europe in the light of the faith from the confines of cloistered abbeys. 
Benedictine monks, concealed within black hooded habits, hidden behind monastery walls, saved Europe. And here is a story that explains how. It seems that God permitted a certain monk an aerial view of the countryside surrounding his abbey. A particularly unique perspective for medieval days, but more amazing than seeing the world from above, was that as he flew over the hills and valleys, the monk was able to see how the forces of hell dispersed their legions, and he was surprised at what he found. Over a Benedictine abbey tucked away in the hillside, demons swarmed like bees around an upset hive. The air was alive with the sound and smell of them. Our saint was happy to keep his distance and quickly flew on, sorely afraid of what he'd see at the large and worldly city over the hill, and sure he'd see scores more fiends inhabiting such an evil place. But as he tentatively approached, he was surprised. There was no cloud of demons buzzing over the city. In fact, he couldn't even see one devil. He flew in for a closer look. Maybe the devils were more subtle in cities, he thought. But hard as he searched, hovering over the streets and houses and market places, he couldn't catch sight of a single evil spirit. He looked in the windows, dove down through alleyways, and searched the busy thoroughfares. And in the end, he did find one, just one lone devil, lounging at the city gate, picking his teeth. Our saint, puzzled, asked God, What the heck? Or words to that effect. And the explanation was simple. Most people, led by their own fallen natures and the lures of the world, make their own trouble. The devils don't need to tempt them. They sin all on their own. It's at the religious houses, the convents and abbeys and seminaries, where the devils need to do the most work to get men and women to fail, and where they can expect the best returns for their labors. The devil works hardest to corrupt that which does the best good. We can see this in the Catholic Church today, 1800 years later, so corrupted and hijacked by evil that it appears sometimes like a spiritual war zone, that there couldn't possibly still be green shoots left to grow beneath the spirit of the world, charred by the fire of heresy and disfigured by the chaos of immorality and the general complacency about both. The devils no longer have to bother with us, it seems. True Catholic monasteries on the earth are few, the dedicated prayers of the holy men and women that for centuries provided graces of reparation and sustenance for the world have almost disappeared. And this is a tragic loss. The cloistered orders were our specialists, the mechanics of the spiritual world that worked behind the scenes to lift us all up toward heaven. Praise be God, the true church, the true sacrifice of the mass will never disappear from the earth. We know this. Bright points of light still pierce to the heavens from all over the globe, where holy masses are offered by pious and valid priests who are leading their congregations in prayer, and still, quote, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. And the most hope-filled reassurance of all, our Lord told his apostles, Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. He is still with us in tabernacles everywhere and in the hearts of the faithful. Likewise, it is recorded that God made several promises to St. Benedict regarding the future of the Benedictine order, including these two, that the Benedictines would continue to exist to the end of the world, and that at the end of the world, in the final battle, the Benedictines would render great service to the Church and confirm many in the faith. We can't know how or if God will manifest these promises, and so many prophecies like this are washed gray and vague in the mists of time that we hesitate to put too much stock in them, and they are not necessary to our faith. But if there were going to be an order that we need not hesitate to place our hope in, it's the ancient order of St. Benedict, the first and greatest in the Western Church. We can add to our daily prayers a plea to the founder of monasticism, St. Benedict, to bring back our cloistered religious communities, especially the Benedictines. Their prayers once lit the spiritual universe and could once again regerminate the true faith at its roots and bring true peace to the world. Happy Feast Day to all who have affiliations with the Benedictines, all our third order friends, and especially our good friend, Father Bernard, OSB. 
Our prayers are always with you, Father, and for that still hoped for Benedictine Abbey. Saint Benedict, pray for us.